All right, guys, this is Jernigam here. My phone just decided to stop. I was talking about what we're watching this, and they were speaking about how Secretary Matt Hancock's people with symptoms getting tested for virus, coronavirus. My phone is very hot, so that's probably why I don't, it's probably stopped. I don't know why. But anyway, we're going to be moving on. I'm talking about that. There was other things I was going to show until the bloody phone started to crash. Uh, is here in Manchester, in a Manchester prison. Uh, that terrorist known as Abdel Rauf Abdallah. Throughout Manchester terrorists attacking Manchester, the bombing with Arade Grande when it happened with the concert uh, a couple of years ago, back I think. That's what they're talking about in the news now. The impact they could have had uh, on the radicalization of Salman Abadi. So that will be a key, key question how this 22 year old became radicalized. And for that, they were hoping to get more Has information. Has heard Salman that Abedi there was two hours delay. Firefighters arriving at the scene. Sister here in the UK. The family so far have had limited interaction with the inquiry. There have been repeated calls for them to take part, offer some sort of statements, or provide some sort of information. Manchester, indeed, the inquiry. Manager's court. Manager's court. To try and help the inquiry and the families of the victims understand exactly what happened. And just to put into context the significance of the last three days uh, of uh, information that we've heard, that opening statement. We have had a statement from Sida Murray. She's the mother of Martin Hett, one of the 22 victims that died that night. She said, I feel like this is going to send us to hell and back. It feels 10 times worse than the trial. We will all be changed people after this, I think. And I think that really speaks to the nature of this inquiry, which will be asking very difficult questions of what happened that night. And crucially, if it could have been stopped, if the scale of it could have been less, if there'd been a different approach either by emergency services or indeed intelligence agencies to stop it happening even in the first place. Katerina, thank you. Armed police have launched a major operation to tackle gun crime in the capital. Several hundred officers raided a traveller site in South East London and arrested a number of suspects who police believe have been involved in supplying firearms to criminal gangs. Our Home Affairs correspondent Mark White was given exclusive access to watch events unfold overnight from the Police Command Centre and joins us from the newsroom. Hello to you, Mark. So what happened? Well, this operation was launched just before 3 a.m. It was a very significant operation in terms of the number of assets involved, several hundred police officers, both armed and unarmed units. And the reason it was such a large deployment of officers... Sky News has been given exclusive access to one of the biggest police operations to ticket suspected gun crime in the north in London. Traveller sites, gypsies, I think. A lot of police there, bloody hell. In the UK. Potentially were in possession of firearms and that there may be firearms concealed about the traveller's site. Uh, so that's why there were very many officers involved in this operation as they raided uh, a large number of structures within this traveller's site almost simultaneously. You can see one of the uh, properties being raided there. And uh, police were very pleased with the operation in terms of the fact that there was no one uh, injured in what was a high-risk uh, operation uh, with the potential for harm to either people on the traveller site or indeed uh, the police. It is the kind of operation that police say is vital in tackling uh, a spike in gun crime, which has uh, seen uh, shootings and other gun crime-related uh, matters rise in the months since lockdown compared with the months uh, over the previous year. Kyle Gordon, who is commander in charge of the firearms unit at the Metropolitan Police, oversaw this operation from a command centre in central London. He said that this operation is the kind of operation we'll see more of in the coming months. Violent crime is the Met's number one priority. We have been clear on that objective. And this is uh, the sort of operation that we need to be doing to tackle violence in the capital. As I say, one of the things around this operation is that we're looking to get to the supply of, of weapons and, and ammunition that are used in the streets of London and get them at source. And to stop them from getting onto the streets of London and into the hands of their own people in the first place.
Well, a total of seven people have been arrested so far, including some of the key suspects the police were looking for. In addition to this, police have seized drugs. Uh, they seized 17 dangerous dogs, uh, and two people are being safeguarded uh, in connection with possible human trafficking uh, so, uh, and modern slavery. So certainly uh, already at this early stage, uh, some significant fines for the police there on that. Uh, search operation is a protracted search operation we're expecting to last at least a couple of days. Mark, thank you. Ministers are planning to override parts of the Brexit deal with a bill that could be inconsistent with the EU withdrawal agreement. The controversial internal market bill has now been published and it's likely to add tension to the negotiations that resumed earlier when the EU's chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, arrived in London. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, has the latest from Westminster. Published this lunchtime is this, the United Kingdom internal market bill, which even by the yardstick of the last few years is one of the most controversial bits of legislation that a government has come up with. Now, it's a complicated piece of legislation that does lots of things, primarily to redistribute the powers that were exercised in Brussels back to Westminster and the devolved administrations. And there's a lot of shouting about lots of bits of this bill. But the most contentious bit is the portion of the bill that seeks to give ministers the power to roll back or annul parts of the withdrawal agreement, the treaty that the UK and the EU, Boris Johnson himself negotiated at the back end of last year. And uh, one of the things that everyone was waiting to find out is whether the uh, bill did what the briefing said it would. And yes, it was, and yes, it does. Uh, it's absolutely crystal clear language. It says that what's in this bill will have effect notwithstanding any relevant international uh, or domestic law. In other words, courts have to pay attention to this bill first. But then an extraordinary list of laws that uh, must take second place uh, against this are printed in this bill. And let's have a look at the graphic which shows it. It says that what's in today's bill can be overridden, I don't know whether you can see it on screen, by the Northern Ireland Protocol, which we're expecting, and the EU uh, withdrawal agreement. There it is. But then look at that next to C any other EU law or international law can be overridden by this piece of legislation. Then further down, look at G. It can override any other legislation, convention or rule of, in, or, of international or domestic law whatsoever, including any order, judgment or decision by the European Court or of any other court or tribunal. Extraordinary powers to defy international law there taken by the government. The government uh, say uh, that this is only... Uh, because uh, they might have to deal with uh, issues around Northern Ireland and that they will not use these powers widely. Um, but what's interesting about this bill is we've been looking at other bits of it. They give the government the power uh, to decide what to do when it comes to tense, difficult areas of this negotiation, state aid and checks. But it doesn't in this piece of legislation spell out actually what the government's ultimately going to do, which is why not only Boris Johnson has annoyed and infuriated uh, Tory rebels like Theresa May for going, appearing to go back on international law, but has also dismayed Brexiteers who think that if Boris Johnson's got a plan to defy EU law and knows how it's going to happen, he should spell it out here rather than saying in this bill we're just going to wait to regulations to be published at some future point to find out how he's actually going to do that. So Boris Johnson's in a very confusing situation this lunchtime, having dismayed many of his own party who believe in the rule of law but many Brexiteers too who want to know quite what everything's going to look like at the end of the year. Well, in the last few moments, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has said that the Prime Minister's plans to override parts of the Brexit deal drive a coach and horses through devolution. This bill is an abomination on almost every level. I mean, firstly, it breaks international law. The government has admitted that. It makes the prospect of a hard border in Ireland all the more likely, um, but it is also a no-holds-barred full frontal assault on devolution. And for anybody who might say, well, the leader of the SNP would say that, wouldn't she? That's exactly the opinion of the Welsh First Minister uh, who's Labour. So, you know, this drives a coach and horses through devolution. Let me just give three quick examples of that. Uh, firstly, it could force Scotland to accept lower food standards. It could force chlorinated chicken from Scotland, if that's the deal Boris Johnson wants to do with Donald Trump. Secondly, 
it would substitute uh, UK government spending priorities in devolved areas for the spending priorities of the democratically elected government of the day in Scotland. So if the government of Scotland wanted to invest in schools and hospitals, uh, the UK government could insist that money went instead to building Boris's bridge to Northern Ireland. And thirdly, this bill would stop the Scottish Parliament introducing the minimum pricing legislation, which has been the flagship public health uh, bill of uh, recent years in Scotland. So this steals, to use the words of the Welsh Government, it steals powers from the devolved administrations that have been with us for 20 years now. Um, and makes it clear, in my view, the only way now to protect devolution is for Scotland to become independent, because otherwise we face a future of the Scottish Parliament being undermined, eroded and frankly crippled. The Fierce Sky News coming up. A government cracks down after a surge in COVID cases. We'll speak to an infectious diseases expert. Well, what's really going on in this world? It's getting more crazier at the minute, guys and girls. One would say. I've done quite a few videos today on air and did a game video of GTA again. I think I'm addicted to playing GTA all the time, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Time go fast when you're having fun. Back on the news again, I'm late there. <laughs> Waiting for things to dry. I'm not a fan for news and adverts, but I don't think most people are. Right, um. Just looking for all my videos that I've done, and the time being while the news channel's loading up. Um, because I don't like waiting in adverts on news programmes, which most people don't. So, just trying to think where... I can just be watching this briefly. Ground, After the adverts, obviously. Milk. A white coffee, just 99p. The world we want to move to as fast as possible is a world in which we can take, everybody can take enabling tests at the beginning of the day, an antigen test to identify whether or not we have the virus or not, uh, with it, a likely pregnancy test within 50 minutes or so, so that we know uh, whether we're able to live our lives as normally as possible. That's the vision that the health secretary and others have been sketching out over the last uh, few days. That's where we intend to get to. In the meantime, NHS Test and Trace is doing a heroic job, and today, today I can tell him that most people get an in-person test result within 24 hours, and the median journey is actually under 10 miles if you have to take a journey to get one. <laughs> That's a short message from uh, Boris Johnson's news. Um, so we've got Donald Trump's as well. You can see Donald Trump's coming off the plane there. Shaking hands with the right wing. <laughs> This video is going to be probably a short one. video uh, let's see here we've got some fires in immigrants whatever that's supposed to be 
to look at that one in a minute. I need to go back to Sky News. You need to feed is a boost in communication around uh, what we're seeing now, which is a worrying rise right across the UK. Is it right then to place the onus of responsibility on young people? We had the health secretary there saying, don't kill your granny, don't go and visit the older generations, it eats you, it's your social gatherings that are causing this spike. Well, I think that uh, if we if we look at some of the uh, actions taken by the government in the last several months, and yes, of course, uh, we, we do need to ensure that children are returning to school, uh, but we've had a, a push for Eat Out to help out, we've had offices reopening, a, tr a push towards using public transport, uh, international travel with air bridges reopening, really all at the same time. So just to put it on the... the um, shoulders of young people, uh, I do think that, that that is quite a confused and mixed message to, to reopen everything uh, without and then also emphasizing around what types of behaviors uh, are expected. Yes, we do see that young people are uh, mass spreaders and even in air, local areas like Hertfordshire, some of these retract, uh, mass spreader events retract to private homes, parties, etc. Uh, but again, this is this is going to be a big challenge for young people and, and the message here is that while we need to include physical distancing and, and keep up uh, these quite uh, difficult habits uh, that this doesn't mean we have to be socially distant as long as we're safe and in reduced numbers and using other technologies as well fatigue is real and this is going to hit hard uh, but right now is not the time to get complacent and uh, Again, we're going to have to reevaluate whether places like clubs are going to be appropriate to stay open when we're seeing a resurgence. And, and in terms of the resurgence and, and the numbers that we're seeing at the moment in those young people, in general terms, young people are, are not seriously affected by COVID. Many are asymptomatic. And yet we've got the message from the health secretary today that people without symptoms shouldn't be using up testing capacity and it's those people that are causing this log jam in the system well uh, we are seeing that uh, there is an increase of under 25 year olds from 4.5 percent to 15 percent who are symptomatic so even though the majority are asymptomatic we're also seeing a rise in, in symptomatic young people and uh, as we go forward we are going to have to open up testing capacity uh, especially in places like campuses at universities as well as in schools, uh, if we are going to then prevent uh, uh, these clusters or, or, or local outbreaks that can quickly spread. So I do think that the testing and tracing system 